and you can find that at the bottom of the Zoom um, app. So welcome to Eurodad's Debt Wednesdays, a webinar series to answer questions around a range of the issues happening around the world. Uh, we're in a situation currently where the way debt repayment difficulties are addressed when they arise is uh, most evidently dysfunctional, driving countries further into crises. Today's session will cover international financial architecture reform, debt workout mechanism and responsible lending and borrowing. Um, and the second part of the session, we'll look at insights about debt issues in Europe. So big thanks to all the organizers, uh, in particular, all of the debt and development organizations and donors. The dads are APMDD, AfroDad, EuroDad, LatinDad, and Jubilee USA. And um, warm thanks to the donors of the session, European Union, Bread of the World, Open Society Foundations, Avena Americas. And thanks to OSISA for providing Portuguese interpretation. So this, um, today's session is separated into two parts um, with a small break in between the two. We're gonna take Q and A's at the end of each presentation. We've got four panelists, two for each part with Q and A at the end. Um, there is a chat function where you can post things and a Q and A for Q and A. Um, and we're gonna take about 10 minute break um, at the end of the first session. So just to briefly present who's with us today. Um, Bayo Elmers, Director of Financing for Sustainable Development Programme at the Global Policy Forum. Thea Sophie Rustin Gratzweet, Policy Advisor of SLUG, Debt Justice Norway. Sergi Kutilas, Co founder of ECONA. And myself, Christina Lasparidis, Lecturer in Economics at the Open University. So I think without further ado, um, one, one thing I should say, for any questions or issues, you're more than welcome to post in the chat, or you can email Ilara Crotty at eurodad.org. I'll post that in the chat just now, um, if I'm able to find it. Okay. So, session one, we're just gonna begin. Um, we're gonna have a presentation by Bodo, um, followed by the presentation by Thea. So without further ado, um, over to you. Great, thank you, Christina, for the introduction and thanks for the organizers for inviting me to speak here. Um, I'm gonna kick it off today with the, well, rather technical, but in fact, highly political topic, which is debt workout mechanisms. Um, it's quite interesting to discuss this topic in a joint session with debt in Europe, because usually you would talk about debt workout mechanism when it comes to debt of developing countries. This has, um, quite obvious reasons. The thing is that um, European countries have mostly domestic debt, um, while developing countries have often external debt. And there are many more ways to, to deal with problems related to domestic debt than to external debt. In fact, I mean, when you have a domestic debt problem, um, you can you can basically just instruct your European Central, the, the central Bank to print the money you need, basically, which we're currently doing with the European Central Bank. However, um, the presentation I'm giving today, actually, I've, I've using edited slides of a presentation I first gave in early 2015 in Greece, when a new government had just come to power, the Syriza government, and um, many debt justice activists, including myself, traveled to Greece because we hoped that the Syriza government would do things differently and um, would tackle their debt problems, Greece, because Greece was in a huge debt crisis. So um, I gave a presentation of debt work on mechanisms there, and actually many others were there as well. This is where I know Christina and Sergi from, because they were working on a debt audit initiative in Greece at about the same time. So in fact, this is a topic which is also related to the situation in Europe. Yeah. Um, well, in fact, the main problem when we talk about debt workout mechanism is that there are actually no debt workout mechanisms. So we're talking, and this is where I start with my, with my presentation. We're actually talking, when we talk about that the debt regime, we're talking about a so-called non-regime, or we're talking about a gaping hole in the international financial architecture. So let me kick this off. Um, yeah, well, in fact, I mean, when you look at insol how insolvencies happen, I mean, when a private person goes bankrupt, when, in, when a corporation goes bankrupt, you have an insolvency law that clearly outlines what, what's, what's going to happen in such a case. It's a predictable regime. And you also have an insolvency court, which is a body that makes decisions, which handles the case. 
and nothing like this um, exists when, when when we talk about sovereign debt, when we talk about countries which 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 end up in a debt problem. The situation, um, well, this situation causes quite a number of different problems. Um, actually, I have my, it's difficult to read my own slides because I have the, the screen on top of it, but anyway. So um, this is just a selection of the problems we're talking about. The first thing is um, we, have, we have a problem that's called forum fragmentation. So um, usually a country has a quite mixed debt stock. You have bilateral debts, you have multilateral debts, you have debts to private creditors, bonds and loans. And there's actually no chance to restructure all these debts in one single comprehensive process. So for the bilateral debts, you would usually turn to the Paris Club. Um, I understand the Paris Club has been handled at a previous session. This is the cartel of, of Western bilateral creditors, and you can negotiate with them. But then, of course, I mean, they cannot restructure your private debts. So private creditors, you need to get your private creditors, which are extremely dispersed. This can be a myriad of different bondholders and small banks to form something like a creditor committee. And then you, can, you, you start to negotiate separately with them. And then this third category, multilateral debts, there's actually at the moment no chance to restructure them at all because there is nothing, there's, there used to be a multilateral debt relief initiative, but it expired and there's no replacement for it. So in fact, you have an extremely lengthy fragmented process. It can take a decade to go through all these different steps to negotiate with all your different creditors. And even for the creditor side, this is highly problematic because um, you, you make different deals with different groups. So you, you cannot do a fair you cannot achieve a fair outcome because you will have a quite deep restructuring with one group, but a quite flat one, so a very small haircut with another group, or you have some holdout creditors. So this is this is basically a key problem that you're facing. Second problem is creditor domination. Um, key example in, U in, in, in Europe was the Eurogroup. Um, Greece had to turn to the Eurogroup for, 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 for debt profiling. Um, it has been a quite dramatic story. Um, um, how 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 that the countries uh, how Greece had, had been dealt with um, the same situation with the developing countries at the Paris Club. So as a developed as an indebted country, you basically turn to a creditor cartel, and you enter into a power relation which is very very unequal. And the decisions and the assessments will always be made by the creditor institutions. So this is a this is another key problem. A third one, which is, has always been extremely important for us as debt justice activists, as CSOs, is that usually only financial considerations are taken into account when, um, when decisions about debt restructurings are being made. That means, um, while the IMF would usually push you to enter into debt restructuring when you lose market access, and the objective is to regain market access, but um, how much money you need, for instance, a, a state needs, a government needs um, to fulfill its development and to, to finance the SDGs, to fulfill the human rights obligations, usually plays no role in the assessment how deep the haircut needs to be. So how much money you need to have left in your budget and you can devote to debt service. So this is, um, this is a system which we are trying to address for a long time, which has always been a priority for, um, for issue for NGOs. Fourth problem. Um, there's a complete absence of transparency and accountability. The Eurogroup has also been a good example here. Um, Yanis Varoufakis uh, has been heavily criticized because he once recorded one of the sessions and made it public. But you think they are all they are all they are all ministers who are accountable to their constituencies anyway. But they negotiate. I mean, usually these 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 bodies they negotiate in in secrecy and they strike deals in secrecy. And as a citizen of a country. You, you don't know what's going to happen there. And the same situation that's at the Paris Club. It's the same as at the Eurogroup. And, and the last point, and here it fits neatly actually to the presentation that Thea is going to give later, there's not no discrimination of responsible or irresponsible lenders in the current regime. So as CSOs, we have always asked that illegitimate debts should be identified and cancelled in, in a debt workout process. But at the moment, there is no distinction of it. That means a dodgy lender who is basically whose money ended up in, an, in corruption in a, in a tax haven and who was very much responsible for causing debt crisis is treated equally to a quite responsible one who, for instance, finance developing projects with the money. So this just just um, just a selection of problems of the regime of the non-regime that we are currently having. Uh, the, the issue is not new on the international agenda. So in fact. Um, we are talking about debt worker institutions since we are talking about sovereign debt. In a, it started with Adam Smith already in the 19th century economic theory that there should be a need for a debt worker mechanism. But um, here are some of the reform proposals that have been discussed more recently in the international debate. 
So in 2002, the IMF came up with the, uh, usually this should also be said, usually the, the discussion picks up as soon as there are a major series of debt crises globally. So there was a big series of crises in the 1990s um, in, in Latin America and in Asia. And after this crisis, the IMF started to suggest the sovereign debt restructuring mechanism. This was basically to ensure um, participation of private creditors in debt restructurings and to, um, to, um, to, well, to, to create some sort of legal predictability for everyone. Um, this was easily, uh, basically suddenly at the same time criticized basically by CSOs because the IMF wanted to put itself in the position to be the judge of the debt workout process. And as the IMF is a highly political body and the creditor itself, um, CSOs immediately criticized it and, and asked for a fair and transparent for a more independent arbitration process. Um, all these proposals in detail are behind the rep links there. So you can study them when, when you have a bit more time than I have in my presentation. CSOs, we also immediately put in the, the demand that you basically link, need to link that workout processes to the financing needs of sovereigns um, for providing essential services for fulfilling development needs um, to the citizens. So we, we all immediately made the link between, between the debt workout process and uh, well, the fiscal space needed to fulfill human rights obligations to build it that way. A third um, proposal then came after the, after the last round of crisis, the global financial crisis in the late 2010s, the UNCTAD um, set up an expert group and suggested something like a debt, debt workout institution which would be simply something like a physical space and institution where um, a debtor can turn to and negotiate with all creditors, basically. This, this such a place doesn't exist at the moment. So this is, this is an interesting thing. So this, this was the idea of a debt workout institution, which is part of the so-called roadmap of, and guides of, for sovereign debt workouts of the, of the UNCTAD. Yeah, and then a, a fourth proposal um, came up after Argentina has been sued by vulture funds in, in New York courts, which was, we, we became a quite, well, we can almost say cruel lawsuit. It lasted for several years. Um, and vulture funds, some vulture funds refused to participate in the debt restructuring process in Argentina and rather litigate for full payment. And then an initiative was started at the UN General Assembly to create something like a multilateral legal framework for some debt restructurings. This would be something like the equivalent to what we have in terms of insolvency law for corporations or for, for private private individuals who, who, who face a debt problem on national level. So something like this doesn't exist yet. This became a highly political um, debate at the UN General Assembly. And in fact, it also never turned out to become a multilateral legal framework. What was eventually adopted then in 2015 are the so-called basic principles for sovereign debt restructuring processes. This is the closest thing we currently have at international level to something like insolvency law, but it is soft law and it's um, unfortunately it didn't, doesn't have much, um, much more impact in practice yet. And um, yeah, last but not least, the fifth um, proposal I want, want, want to quickly turn to is that the, the UNCTAD is obviously working currently on the idea of a global debt authority which I assume is, um, it's not public, the paper yet, it should, should, should go public every, every day, I understand now. Um, but it's, it seems to be like something like an updated idea or the, the further development of the debt workout institution idea. These are just a few reform proposals to, to fill the governance gap. So, I mean, there are actually, academics have developed um, hundreds more of those, but the central, the central message is indeed, I mean, we have a massive, um, we have a massive gap in the international financial architecture. And this turns to the problem that we indeed have no effective institutions to, to solve debt crisis, sovereign debt crisis in a fair, speedy and responsible manner. And this is why we have so many, well, side effects and collateral damage related to them. Yeah, um, then um, just quickly, I think I'm slowly running out of time. So let me just quickly present, I mean, it has been, I think many of you have been, been have been involved with the issues on the agenda of debt justice activists, civil society organizations for a long time. So we basically developed. I think we we as civil society community never had a the one proposal how we want the debt workout mechanism to look like, but we had a set of principles basically, and these are the ten principles. They are actually part of a UDAT paper that has been endorsed by many other organizations as well. I mean, it has been published by UDAT, but it's a joint CSO paper. It's called, We Can Work It Out. 
and um, yeah, the principles are basically that we would need a decision-making process which is independent from creditors, so something which is not the Paris Club, not the Eurogroup, but something like, like an independent arbitration mechanism or an insolvency court. We would need to have an independent assessment of debt sustainability. Um, this basically to, to uh, it turned out that the IMF and the, and the IMF usually um, assess debt sustainability. And because it's a creditor, basically, it was always too positive, basically. Usually the assessment was not, not accurate. And there, there seems to be quite bias when creditors uh, assess debt sustainability to, well, to, to make the situation look better than it actually is. Then, of course, the third one, I mean, to overcome this form fragmentation problem, you would need a comprehensive treatment of a country's debt stock in a single process. That means bilateral, multilateral, private debts all together. Yeah, and then the question is what should trigger that restructuring process? Um, and here, the idea is to, to assess when the point is reached that a country runs out of funding to fulfill their human rights obligations, then there should be a trigger mechanism that, that basically um, starts a debt restructuring process. And this, is, this would also be, need to be part of an assessment. The first is indeed, I mean, to address the, the, um, the, the problem with intransparency, inclusive participation of all stakeholders. Um, yeah, and to make, to make um, the sixth one, transparency of debt restructuring negotiations and their outcomes must be public, so no more backroom tank negotiations. There should be a standstill on external debt payments um, while the debt restructuring negotiation takes place. Actually, Greece is again a good example here. Um, there was um, many private creditors sold their, basically, I mean, Greece continued paying private creditors and some many, many private creditors sold their debt to Greece while um, the government was negotiating for, for the Eurogroup, uh, with the Eurogroup, which eventually led to a situation basically that the private banks who had lent, um, who were exposed, have been bailed out and all the money has been basically transferred to public accounts. So for, for such reason, you would need to have a standstill on external debt payments. Yeah, and then the eighth principle is related to the vulture funds problem. Uh, you would need to have a stay on creditor litigation. So while the debt restructuring process takes place, no creditor can litigate for full payment. This to ensure a fair treatment of everyone. The ninth one is related to the same problem. You would need enforceability. So it needs to be clear that um, once a decision is made, this is binding for all creditors. This is actually the case in private insolvency law. And yeah, and of course, um, the basic idea when it comes to sovereign is um, to recreate the fiscal space to finance development and fulfill their human rights obligations. And this, of course, is extremely relevant um, at the moment now in the COVID-19 crisis, all the discussions about fiscal space. How do we create the fiscal space that all countries can recover from the current crisis? And of course, especially in heavily indebted countries where a huge share of public spending goes to debt service, this fiscal space is not there. And the whole idea of the process is basically to recreate this fiscal space. Yeah, this is where I stop. Um, just a few reading tips for you. These are three publications um, where the issue is dealt with in more detail. Uh, I assume that you that is gonna circulate the, the, the publications later so you can continue reading here. And I thank you all for listening and I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you, Bodo. That's that's great. And just some time. So we're just going to move on to our second presenter for the session, Thea Sophie Ruston Gratzweit from Slug at Justice Norway. Hi. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for um, letting me come here today and talk to you guys. Uh, Bodo has given you a comprehensive and good overview of all the issues relating to uh, resolving the crisis that are. <laughs> actually already happening but when it comes to principles for responsible lending and borrowing the aim is just basically to prevent the crisis from occurring altogether so that's sort of one little issue that um, I'm going to talk a little bit about today also is that um, in, a, in general um, crisis that actually exist here and now uh, have uh, such huge uh, human consequences that it's natural that we have to sort of uh, focus a lot of our energy into um, making good mechanisms for resolving the crisis. But this unfortunately sort of makes 
uh, the work on uh, strengthening systems for preventing future debt crisis sort of end up a little bit on, in the back seat. So that's uh, one thing to have in mind that it's important to put a lot of emphasis on the prevention of future crisis uh, at the same time that we're talking about resolving the ones who actually exist here and now. Um, and this is sort of like a kind of like a broad topic and um, there are different aspects to responsibility when it comes to lending to sovereigns and borrowing from uh, borrowing governments. Um, and, and one aspect that is getting a lot of attention these days is linked to transparency. And the other aspect uh, is linked to principles and systems for ensuring responsibility in lending to governments and borrowing from governments. So uh, when it comes to transparency, this is sort of like the lower hanging fruit that um, uh, today there is uh, no real good um, global systems for ensuring that all information on loans to governments is publicly disclosed. Uh, so it's kind of difficult to assess whether you're being responsible, uh, at least if you're a lender, uh, you're sort of uh, basing your investment decisions on fragmented information. So, and also when it comes to transparency, this is sort of like a, a solution that is promoted by bilateral lenders and multilateral institutions, sort of as um, um, <laughs> a solution that is supposed to uh, solve everything. If you have information access, then you will automat automatically sort of uh, be responsible and have ensured responsibility. This is, um, I believe, not the case, but uh, ensuring uh, access to proper information is definitely an important prerequisite for uh, securing responsibility. So it's important to sort of strengthen transparency, but it's also important to not just um, uh, end up um, focusing the uh, responsibility discussion on transparency alone and not, then sort of not getting to the next step, which is uh, the global consensus on responsible lending and borrowing practices. So in the Addis Ababa Action Agenda in 2015, uh, countries stated that uh, they will work towards uh, the establishment of a global consensus on what sort of constitutes and a responsible lender and a responsible borrower. And this uh, global consensus uh, has not yet materialized. Uh, and at the moment, there, there is not much sort of headway or political will from at least uh, rich countries in um, advancing this agenda. Uh, at the moment, they're talking about transparency, transparency, and transparency, but the global consensus on responsibility is sort of dormant. Uh, but um, there are different frameworks existing. Um, one is uh, the ONGTAD principles on responsible lever and lending and borrowing. Uh, I can send you sort of like a, a list of different frameworks uh, later that Yolanda can disseminate so you don't have to uh, worry about losing all the details here. <laughs> but uh, the ONGTAD principles on responsible lending and borrowing is one international framework. Uh, another one is the G20 operational guidelines. Um, the um, IMF and the World Bank have a common uh, framework, um, debt sustainability framework, and they do common debt sustainability analysis. And the OECD have some systems, and there are some different um, frameworks uh, out there. Um, but uh, there is not really a consensus uh, around one framework that we all should sort of implement uh, into national legislation. And um, um, yeah, this uh, consensus needs uh, further political discussions uh, to land on a common framework. But uh, another aspect is that these principles uh, for responsible lending and borrowing apply to bilateral lenders, um, sovereigns, uh, borrowing governments to multilateral institutions like the IMF World Bank and other regional uh, investment banks. Um, but the last aspect of responsibility are the private investors. And at the moment, it's uh, private investors and lending money to governments in the global south that have created uh, sort of the, the biggest portion of the issues related to unsustainable debt levels and, and irresponsible lending and borrowing, basically. 
And this is um, sort of, um, we don't have, have the time to go into a lot of small details on this, unfortunately, since we're a little sort of uh, time constrained, but basically in the years after the global financial crisis leading up to the pandemic, uh, especially this private debt ballooned uh, due to sort of lack of regulations. Um, so um, low interest rates um, and um, quantitative easings from uh, the European Union and uh, uh, the United States sort of uh, made a lot of new hot money uh, around and investors took this money and invested them, for example, in government bonds in the global south because there were higher yields and this was a more attractive investment opportunity. And then uh, a lot of private investors invested in government debt in the same time and the private debts ballooned. So. Uh, one important aspect to focus on when it comes to responsibility in lending and borrowing are the private investors. And I can just um, exemplify this um, by one system, <laughs> just to show you uh, one way to do it. And it's not perfect, and there are many different ways of doing this, but uh, just to illustrate the way this could be set up. Uh, Christina, just let me know when I have a couple of minutes left. <laughs> <laughs> um, you still have plenty of time, you're just at seven minutes. Good. <laughs> um, the Norwegian Government Pension Fund Global uh, is the biggest um, sovereign investment fund in the world. Um, a lot of you probably know this um, already, that uh, the Norwegian state has this uh, global investment fund based on oil revenues basically from the last 50 years. And, and it's at the time moment, it's like the, the biggest sovereign investment fund and the, um, the Norwegian pension fund owns roughly little over 1% of all um, stocks um, on the global market. So it's quite big just to give you a little scale. And um, the government pension fund has quite an elaborate system for environmental, social governance, uh, sort of responsibilities uh, and investing in stocks and also in government bonds. Uh, so this system they've set up for investments in government bonds is one way of illustrating what it means to sort of ensure responsibility. It's not perfect, but just to give you an example. So um, there's a, um, a framework that is explicit on things like transparency, accountability, um, um, government's ability to withstand financial shocks, um, uh, that sustainability, um, things like um, labor rights and uh, living standards and um, uh, rule of law, corruption risk, um, yeah, different sort of uh, aspects linked to and that could affect the financial risk implicated in sort of borrowing to a country and, and risks related to the revenues from the loan ending up in corrupt deals or being um, misused to um, oppress uh, your, um, your um, <laughs> public uh, in the, um, yeah, the, the population. So, so there are kind of like uh, concrete criteria. And then there's a committee in the Norwegian banks uh, investment management that do an assessment of how a country is sort of scoring on these different criteria. And based on that assessment, they uh, either, they will send, um, what do you call it? Like um, they will um, uh, give the central bank, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, yeah, the board of the central bank will uh, have this uh, assessment and they will decide whether to approve or uh, not approve uh, this specific uh, sovereign borrower. And then uh, the list of approved uh, issuers of sovereign bonds will then sort of make up the investment universe that uh, central bank's investment management either you can then um, invest in government bonds in, basically. And then it's monitored throughout the year. And if the uh, issuer sort of uh, changes status on either one of these criteria, there will be a new assessment and, um, and uh, approval can be sort of uh, withdrawn or uh, there can be given, given a new approval if somebody has sort of um, bettered their score. Um, 
so this is one sort of concrete way of um, of so, sort of operationalizing some specific principles that are aimed at ensuring responsibility in lending and that are supposed to sort of avoid the investment uh, contributing to uh, the buildup of unsustainable debt levels that could lead to uh, government debt crisis. Um, so, so this is sort of one of the things that are lacking on the, on the global scale. There are different sort of frameworks, some different principles, some different operationalizations, but that some sort of common denominator is that they are, um, it's, uh, they're not strong enough and they're not broad enough and there is not a global consensus on what it should mean to be a responsible lender and a responsible borrower. So, so that is a sort of um, basically uh, the issue right now. Uh, we need to strengthen transparency, but strengthening transparency mm -hmm. and disclosure of information is important, but it's not enough. And that uh, civil society should sort of uh, keep pushing for governments to advance the discussions around establishing a global consensus on responsible lending and borrowing and ratifying this um, hopefully global consensus uh, agreement, international uh, legislation, and uh, ensuring sort of proper um, global and national regulations that will sort of make sure that these uh, bubbles don't blow up in government debt and to ensure um, responsibility and um, yeah, make sure that we don't have a future accumulation of unsustainable debt. Um that's uh yeah that's uh, basically the introduction but i guess you guys probably have some interesting questions that will uh we can go deeper into some of the details thank you so much thank you thea that's really fascinating to hear some of those details about what's happening in norway um i certainly have a lot of questions I'm just wondering if anybody in the audience uh, would like to um, ask either of the two panelists uh, any questions. You can use the raise hand function. I thought I saw a hand earlier, but maybe it was disappeared. Um, you can also use the chat function and the Q&A function. And perhaps while we're waiting for those, it might be an opportunity for me to ask a question while we wait for some questions to come in from the floor. Um, so the way that you were describing, Thea, the, um, the sort of operationalization of responsible principles in the case of Norway, um, together with, if I remember correctly, an example of Norway conducting a creditor-led audit of um, illegitimate debts that it had given uh, for old um, development loans that it cancelled uh, after an audit with Deloitte, I think. Um, there's a sense of like there being a bit of a tradition of like a friendlier approach in the northern creditors. Um, what's what do you think? Um, what what can you say more about that? And is there is it the case that the Nordic countries are slightly more friendly to debtors? And, and why do you think that is? Oh, that's a difficult question. I mean, at at the at the one side, Norway has previously had sort of like a slightly sort of a champion role when it comes to um resolving the crisis and uh, being a responsible lender um unfortunately i couldn't really say that the current government is very invested uh, in this agenda and i wouldn't uh, necessarily brag about being <laughs> a global lead on this topic uh, at the moment uh, norway being that but um but at the same time uh, they definitely have sort of a tradition for for uh, sort of um, talking about uh, sovereign debt crisis and responsible lending uh, in a way that is focused on the lenders sort of um, 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 
<laughs> what to say, <laughs> like personal obligation to lend in a way that doesn't contribute to debt crisis, uh, that uh, hopefully doesn't contribute to uh, financing illegitimate or corrupt regimes that will use the, the loans to <laughs> oppress um, their population. Uh, so there is a, definitely like a tradition uh, for, for thinking about uh, responsible lending in this way. So I think uh, what the main strengths of, um, of the due diligence system of this uh, sovereign pension fund is that <clears throat> uh, the framework is, uh, is um, debated in, the, in parliament each year. So, so basically it means that Norwegian constituents have access to the, uh, there's um, uh, sort of public uh, disclosure of all the investments, uh, the amounts to which countries, and this is every year, this is uh, a white paper in the parliament and it's a public discussion and you have uh, 40, 50 different uh, civil society organizations uh, sort of just uh, uh, hassling the parliament and the financial committee with the different uh, uh, demands for strengthening responsibility. So. So that definitely helps in ensuring uh, responsibleness because it's easier to argue that this uh, sovereign wealth fund is actually me as a constituent. It's it's my money. You're making this investment on my behalf and other five million Norwegians. So it's easier to sort of demand uh, responsibility in in those investments. So so that's probably one aspect. So I'm just going to go through some of these really interesting questions that are coming through the chat. I think some of them are directed to both, yeah, to both panelists. So um, one question about global debt audit, how can global debt audit be implemented? And is this different to citizen debt audit? Um, more generally, how do you think civil society can advance national legislation? I'm sure you've both got very um, strong experiences uh, in that. Um, I'll just take another couple of questions. Um, what are the concrete steps we can take to increase transparency? Registries, perhaps. Um, and another question, which is just more on the Nordic countries. What kind of role might Nordics that often don't have a tradition of lending, but rather providing grants? So that might be um, something there. Um, so do you want to address those three questions? And then there's, there's three more. For, for, for later. Will you start, Bodo? Okay, yeah, while well, you're catching your breath into talking uh, a little. Um, yeah, on the questions on debt audits, I mean, there's currently no experience on, on global debt audits. I mean, debt audits usually take place on country level. And I mean, we have experience with three different types. I mean, Mozambique, Tia mentioned the one in Mozambique that was largely commissioned by, by the development partners, by the donors to, to control the, the debt situation of the, of, the, of the government. Then we had the experience in Greece, in Greece which was an audit commissioned by the parliament itself. And then, of course, and Otara mentioned this, there, there have been citizens debt audit initiatives in, in many different countries. Um, a key challenge I see when it comes to debt audits is that it's always a question against which criteria you audit. And this is actually why we need um, sort of agreed responsible lending and borrowing principles because, um, well, you basically need a set of criteria to distinguish what type of, um, of, of debt is legitimate and illegitimate or responsible and irresponsible. And this is basically the, where the discussion about this, this global consensus on responsible lending and borrowing comes in, I would say. Um, yeah, on how to advance national legislation, um, I mean, I assume the question is related to national vulture funds legislation. Um, this is extremely important, especially in countries that host major financial centers. So especially in the USA and the U United Kingdom, the situation is that most bonds um, that are issued under external law are issued under either English or New York American laws. So basically, in case a creditor wants to sue a debtor, usually the place where this takes it's happen is either New York or London. And this is this is where it is key to 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 have national vulture funds legislation. Um, we, we know we have we have our, our comrades basically in the USA and the UK are working for this for many years now with 
well, some more, well, not full success, but some success in, in the UK, there is a, there's national legislation, but very limited ones. But um, the thing is that in fact, if you had a multilateral legal framework, this could overrule national legislation, make it unnecessary. So the idea behind um, the multilateral legal framework for sovereign debt restructurings that I presented, or also about of the sovereign debt restructuring mechanism that the IMF proposed, was actually to make it to make national legislation unnecessary by creating a multilateral fleet legal framework. Um, yeah, that was the question on transparency. I mean, transparency indeed. I mean, there, there are two dimensions of transparency. The, the first thing is, and, and you that Daniel Daniel Munova just re published a great re re um, report on this, that there is actually. I mean, we don't even know who owns the debts and the, what the conditions of the debts are basically. And they are indeed having public registries um, and uh, obligatory disclosure of all claims uh, would make a lot of sense. Uh, we even campaigned in the past, we had a demand to say that in fact, um, loans which have not been disclosed ex ante or bonds that have not be disclosed ex ante should not be eligible to take part in any debt restructuring exercise or should not be enforceable to create some kind of, of incentive mechanism or pressure mechanisms to make debtors, uh, to make creditors basically disclose their claims. So that's, um, that, that's one thing. But there's actually a second dimension of transparency, which is the, the process transparency I mentioned that in fact, we don't have transparency about what, what, for instance, what the Paris Club is doing or what, or, I mean, the EU group is currently not active, but we had very little transparency about how they were negotiating there. So that's the second dimension to take in mind. And yeah, perhaps uh, the last one, I mean, I think this came from Hannah. The question is, I mean, that some countries only give grants um, while others give loans um, and how to deal with the situation or what's, what's the point of, uh, what, what's the role of countries that gives grants in this game? I think it has a very strong um, um, political ones and normative ones because if you're a grant donor, then in fact, a substantial share of your ODA at the moment refinances the debt service that your partner country is basically forwarding to the creditors, to third parties. Um, so I find that especially donor countries or partner countries, which basically provide their development assistance in forms of grants should very, make a very strong case to say there needs to be in a country which has a critical debt situation, there needs to be a debt restructuring process, there needs to be in, in involvement, participation of all creditors, because this is the only chance to secure that the debt payments, in fact, are translated into development programs and not just go into the central bank's treasury and then are being used to, to pay, pay off foreign creditors in, 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 in extra debt, yeah. And yeah, I think this, I stop here, thank you. I should say just if you can just respond a little bit more promptly so we can get through all the questions because quite a few have just come through. Yep. I could say something about the role of the Nordics. Yeah, um, uh, just to echo what Bodo just said, and this is one of like the, the general issues we're having at the moment with the Norwegian government is that the, they're using sort of the argument that we're not a big bilateral lender anymore. Of course, we are through the Norwegian sovereign pension fund, but not like bilaterally. And, and they're sort of using that as an argument that we can't have really have that many uh, opinions on this right now because we're not one of the big fish and uh, fishes and we don't want to sort of uh, annoy other Paris club members. But I think that's a really important uh, argument that Bodo made there that uh, uh, on the contrary we should sort of um, referencing to uh, having uh, conducted debt audits in the past and having uh, bilaterally um, cancelled illegitimate debts and being uh, one of the biggest uh, providers of ODA, we should definitely sort of step up and and, and take a global lead on this uh, policy-wise. But um, the chances of that happening right now <laughs> in Norway, at least, I'm I'm uh, I'm hoping that the parliamentary uh, elections this fall might <laughs> bring some new <laughs> possibility this okay so i'm just going to um pick up some of the other ones that have come through um so a couple of short ones at this time when the debt waiver is being discussed are there simultaneous discussions on debt reform um so from cornelio how are the amounts that are lent to other nations controlled which is a very interesting question um is there a challenge in providing responsible loans, but without imposing conditionality? That's from Hannah. 
Um, I'm just going to, um, shall I, shall I um, pause it there or shall I um, give, give you a few more? I think we've got 10 minutes left, so I might just um, come with a few more questions. Come, yeah. um, maybe I could just say something about uh, Hannah's question on uh, conditionalities and then you can say something more about O. Um, it's an interesting question because, uh, for example, when it comes to this system for ensuring responsible lending and borrowing, when it comes to the Norwegian government pension fund, is that um, uh, it's not uh, imposing um, conditionalities in loans, uh, 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 but uh, on the other side, there are quite strict criteria that exclude potentially a big group of uh, sovereign um, uh, issue, bond issuers. So that's definitely a difficult sort of uh, flip side of the coin. It's not enforcing policy changes uh, in another sovereign, but you're excluding them. And at the moment, there's quite, I think there's maybe just like 20 something um, bond issuers, mostly OECD countries that are actually eligible uh, with these strict criteria. So I'm, uh, that's just to illustrate some of the sort of <laughs> difficult aspects of ensuring responsibility. At the moment, these strict criteria um, translates into maybe only 30 countries being eligible. So that's a definitely a, uh, excluding a huge group of countries from important investment um, possibilities. So that's a difficult flip side of the coin. Um, so a couple of questions for Bodo, um, one from Sinov. Um, restructurings can stretch out for years, as you said, but IMF states that recent restructurings have averaged around only one year in duration. What has led to this improvement and what is wrong with them? It seems very suspicious that it suddenly only takes one year, but countries are still struggling with debt. Um, so it would be good to know the source of that information, if that's possible. Um, also, another question from Andrew. Bodo, I've spent a lot of time in my PhD research interviewing investors, um, including vulture funds. The thing I continually hear from them is that the current sovereign restructuring, um, sorry, current sovereign restructuring non-system functions incredibly efficiently. That is that they argue that sovereign restructurings occur much more quickly than restructurings in the corporate bankruptcy world. And they suggest that creating sovereign restructuring policy from outlier cases such as Argentina is dangerous. I'm not saying I agree, but I'm curious how you would respond to them. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, the, the IMF's point that, that, that restructurings take only a, a year is quite interesting because I think Argentina is trying to restructure its debt with the IMF for quite some time now already. And it's, um, it's, it's taking a long, uh, it's taking a long time for, for um, <laughs> And it's actually it's actually the IMF refuses to 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 of course to 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 give any any clear um, I mean ex, extend ex, except maturity maturity extension to give any 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 clear um, a haircut or so. Um, I mean recent deals um, Ecuador for instance re went relatively quickly, but um, most external analysts argue is that the deal that um, private creditors got in Ecuador um, was too good. Um, for the creditor side, too bad for the debtor side, which leads to a situation that probably the outcome is not sustainable, and um, and uh, we will probably see a re so-called repeat restructuring. We will, the country will fall into an unsustainable debt situation again in a few years, and um, and yeah, and this this might happen. So one thing why why um, the, the same is with vulture funds. In fact, the conditions have been relatively good for the, that the debt nations gave to creditors which basically um, reduced the need for, for litigation and also sped up the processes. But the, the situation is that this not, does not lead to sustainable outcomes. The Paris Club is the same situation. Um, the Paris Club is arguing proudly that they have handled more than 600 cases in their history, which indeed means, um, since we have less than 200 countries on the planet, that they have indeed um, treated each, I mean, each country at least three times if you would divide it. So, the problem is indeed when you do it quickly, you either usually just restructure one category of your debts, for instance, not the private debts, but not the bilateral or the multilateral ones, or you do you 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 don't do, do a, hair, a deep haircut, which which creates a sustainable outcome. This is a bit of the problem. And then there was the question on the political situation. If debt reform is being discussed, um, yes, it is very high on the agenda. Um, on the United Nations agenda, it has been very big. There's been 
for the first time for, for years or decades, a high level event with heads of state participation in March, which discussed debt architecture reforms. But it was just a policy discussion, but not the decision making forms. And then, of course, the G20 um, has, has passed two initiatives um, the debt services suspension initiative in April last year, and then later the common framework. Uh, most of us would say that these are highly insufficient to fix the debt problems, but indeed there is obviously a dynamic and um, we do accept the dynamic to continue because especially because the DSSI is going to expire by the end of the year. So all the suspended debt is going to be well, basically be, become reactivated at this time. And then it turns out how, how big the problem really was. And of course, um, we might also see, I mean, the big debt crisis is going to come when there's an interest rate reversal. At the moment, the situation in developing countries, I mean, there, there is a lot of debt out there, but there's also a lot of liquidity out there. So countries can still reschedule their debts. And although developing countries pay extremely high interest rates, I mean, in many so-called frontier markets, Angola, Ghana, the, the coupons on bonds are 10% per year. While in countries like Germany, USA, Norway, or so it's like near zero percent, it's still a low interest environment at the moment. So when when in the, the main financial centers of the world, in Europe and the USA, the, the interest rates are going up again, then we see that the systemic debt crisis come, and then the problem is going to become worse. And this is actually why uh, a former IMF director, Christine Lagarde, always said you should fix the roof while the sun is shining. So in fact, the situation we have at the moment is still quite good. I mean, the big debt crisis, the big balloon, the balloon is going to explode actually when, when central banks change the trajectory, when they take the liquidity out of the markets again and interest rates are going to rise. And then it would be actually really important to have better institutions in place. If you could also just address that vulture fund question um, that An An Andrew uh, made uh, about, did you, uh, I can repeat it, um, in PhD research that he's heard from vulture funds and other investors at the current sovereign restructuring non-system functions incredibly efficiently. They argue that sovereign restructurings occur much more quickly than restructuring corporate bankruptcy and that creating policy out outlier cases is dangerous. How would you respond to them? Um, I mean, since the, since the very dramatic case in Argentina, um, there has been indeed not, not no longer such a, such a dramatic case. But um, in fact, I think this has been because in, because I mean, because basically private creditors got relatively good deals. This is, this is I mean, this was already my response to this basically that um, in fact, I mean, to my, I mean, the, 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 the information I have is that we haven't seen such drastic cases like the one in Argentina in 2015 anymore in recent years, but um, this doesn't mean that the problem is, is, is no longer exists. Of course, I mean, more and more bonds have these so-called um, uh, collective action clauses now, which are supposed to facilitate um, um, majority restructuring, which is a quite complex issue, but the idea is that, that, that you basically, a majority of creditors can make an agreement, um, which is then binding for the, for the creditors as a whole, basically. So this, this helps to address the vulture funds problem. But I mean, this, yeah, I mean, the, the, there's, there's still lots of bonds out, out there who don't have these, these collective action clauses. And it should also be noted that um, non-private creditors can be holdouts too, basically. In fact, I mean, for me, the IMF is, is almost the worst vulture we have out there, basically, including also the Paris Club creditors, because the IMF always insists to be paid in full, basically, including when they basically made terribly use, useless deals like the ones like the ones of giving $58 billion to, to Argentina in a situation when the country uh, basically was already in a difficult situation. And it was very clear that it was politically motivated lending pushed by the, by the former Trump administration, which had good, good, good relationship with the former Macri administration. So there are vultures among the, I mean, they're not called like that, but there are vultures among the official lenders too. Okay, um, so I'm not sure if we have time for more questions. Maybe there's an empirical question at the bottom if anybody wants to um, catch that one by Alonso uh, regarding tracking the ownership of sort of securities in real time. Um, if anybody has a response to that, maybe you can post it uh, and reply directly in the chat. Um, but other than that, I think we've sort of coming to time for our first session. Um, thanks to 
everybody for their engagement and to Thea and Bodo for really good, um, yeah, interesting presentation. So we're going to take a 10 minute break um, and we'll be back at 10 past for the second part of this webinar. Well, thank you, Christina, for moderating. Thank you so much. Um, okay. We're now turning to the second topic, which is um, introduction to debt in Europe. The way how we do it is that we are playing, Christine and I are playing musical chairs. So um, I'm taking over the moderator role and we have two uh, great speakers. The first one is Sergi Cotillas, Sergi Cotillas, who is, um, as you, well, they were introduced already, he's a co-founder of Econa. And then followed by Christina, Christina Lascaridis, who is a lecturer at the Open University in the UK. Um, yeah, both of about 15 minutes. Sergi, do you like to start straight away? Yes, thanks, Bodo. Hi, everyone. So I'd like to, to speak about uh, uh, where we are standing in, in Europe and do a political economy analysis of the last years. Uh, related to the European Union and the European Monetary Union and the, the debt uh, in the different countries and also the, the state of mutualization, let's say, of, of, these, of these debts. So for that, I will uh, share a presentation. So I'll share my screen right now. Okay. So hope you see it well. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I want to focus on the role of nation states and the conflict uh, conflicts that this, uh, the supposed uh, conflicts that nation states have with uh, the transnational institutions in, in the EU and how uh, this has to be analyzed closely to see that uh, it, it is actually through these transnational institutions that nation states uh, are, you know, uh, or at least some nation states, especially Germany, are uh, reasserting their power. And uh, for Germany, uh, this, uh, these channels are the way to, let's say, to, to keep or to, to create hegemony in the EU. So to start, uh, there is a, let's say, a theoretical debate uh, since uh, mm, 60 years ago, 50 years ago, related to, to whether the European Union will move into uh, towards integration and there will be spillovers that will end up creating uh, like a nation. Uh, and there are different theories, as I say, one is a, this uh, neo-functionalist that, that says that uh, these spillovers will, let's say, generate disintegration, but then there is another, other theories uh, that state that, uh, in fact, the EU is a treaty-based alliance between nation states, and that actually uh, it saved nation states after the Second World War. Uh, so that, in fact, mm, this is, uh, it's not reducing the sovereignty of nation states, but uh, making nation states in Europe relate among them through different channels, let's say. Uh, however, uh, mm, it is difficult uh, in such a context, uh, in such a context, and in such a complex, uh, let's say, arrangement. It is difficult to have a, a theory, like a general theory. I think uh, we have to analyze this historic, historically, and, and in very concrete, uh, let's say, uh, terms. In a, let's say, analyzing the political economy of what has happened, and that's what I, what I'd like to do. So uh, what we see is a hegemony arising in the, in the EU and hierarchy uh, uh, as the euro has, uh, let's say, uh, emerged uh, as a system of uh, creating asymmetric uh, bargaining games. Uh, so in this, in this asymmetric game, the, the core countries have, shift, have shifted uh, the cost uh, onto the, the weaker periphery. Uh, 
the institutional reforms that took place after the, the crisis of 2007 to 2009, and then the Eurozone crisis, have uh, remained limited and suit the interests of Germany. So they don't, they haven't moved towards, you know, like uh, full integration. Uh, the elimination of exchange rates and single monetary policy uh, have been a decisive factor for uh, the mercantilist strategy of Germany. So uh, creating enormous trade surpluses and uh, the ability to lend afterwards with this, uh, through like with these financial surpluses that have uh, generated the, let's say the, the exports, the, the enormous exports. And then, this absence of, uh, in absence of monetary union, or countries like the countries in the south, Greece, Spain, Italy, uh, would have devalued and, uh, let's say, adjusted, but this uh, couldn't happen. So these are this uh, hegemony, this uh, of Germany and, and core countries, is mediated. It's a nation, national state hegemony mediated through these through these institutions. So these unequal bargaining uh, flows from, from uh, two crucial aspects of the euro. One is a monopoly of the ECB of the, over the creation of liquidity uh, in, in the eurozone, in the European uh, Monetary Union. Uh, and then is the threat, and the second one is the threat uh, felt by, by people, by the individuals uh, in the, mostly in the, in the southern countries, which are the weakest uh, in this, in this arrangement, uh, that they will lose money, uh, they will have, they will, you know, engage into political chaos and have uh, identity lost as Europeans if they exit the EMU. So, uh, if if it were not for that, for example, Athens uh, or Greece, not Athens, but you know. Uh, uh, would have uh, probably defaulted very, very early in the in the eurozone crisis, for example. Thus, the euro is central to this hegemony that Germany has achieved, and it it's thanks to the euro that that we have this uh, the indebtedness and the weak growth in the in the in the southern periphery. So as, as I say, Germany, German conditional hegemony is, uh, is mediated through these institutions, through the EU institutions. But it, to be clear, I don't, I don't mean that Germany controls directly the EU institutions. It has to, you know, exert, you know, like soft power to, to, to exert pressure in these, in, in, on these institutions. Like, for example, the ECB is not the Bundesbank. And the, the operations of the ECB and the general institutions are not directly controlled by Germany. Uh, so it, it has to mediate this, uh, this uh, power uh, through this bargaining uh, in, in these institutions. So uh, to, to make a, a review of the, of the transformations that we've seen in the last years, uh, of the institutions of the European Union that have helped uh, Germany achieve this hegemony uh, and that somehow have been also limited by Germany not to lose sovereignty and not to lose uh, this, this, this position of hegemony uh, have been uh, the, the institutions created, the new institutions created after the 2007-2009 crisis. Uh, which have been the, all the reforms in the treaties to inc inscribe austerity, the new institutions to manage the bailouts, the, the new programs, the, like purchasing programs of the ECB and, and the banking union. All these have you know, been uh, apparently to, to increase integration, but they have been capped by, by Germany. Uh, as I say here, uh, so the, these transformations are incomplete. We didn't get euro bonds. We didn't have a full mutualization of debt. There was no direct monetization of state deficits. There was there were these purchasing uh, programs by the ECB, but always you know with uh, strict fiscal rules for the states of reducing deficits, etc. And then uh, the banking union came with no deposit guarantee fund. So it was not a full banking union. And that's also because of 
um, Germany because of the interest of core countries, but especially Germany wanting to keep this hegemony. So Germany protects its hegemonic power through discretion. Uh, mm, we are seeing this in the previous crisis, but now we are seeing the same. So my point here is that uh, even if we you know, are seeing a more flexible policies, these are also in, in coherent with this uh, tri the protection of hegem hegemony by, by Germany. So we have a new purchasing uh, uh, program by the ECB, and that is, uh, is keeping the Eurozone together. We have a flexibilization or, or lifting of austerity. We have had some flexibilization in some cases, not with Greece, for example, during the Eurozone crisis, but for example, with Spain, they were more flexible because you know, Rajoy was an ally of, of Germany or like a popular party government in Spain after 2012, was an ally of, of Germany. So there was some, some uh, uh, flexibility. Now we are seeing that there is a complete lifting of austerity and state rules, state aid rules, sorry. And then uh, a new, new budget, new next generation proposal like this Hamiltonian moment, but which is quite modest and probably limited. It, there, not, there is not going to be uh, further steps in this direction, or if there are, there, there will need new negotiations and, and bargaining, which is difficult. And it's a modest uh, fiscal Im impact. Uh, it's uh, 1.5 or 2.5 or 2.2% sorry GDP uh, impact along uh, the next three years. So this fiscal, uh, let's say, impulse will be will be modest as well. So uh, I want to show uh, what this, uh, let's say, flexibility means. That uh, we are seeing that, for example, the, the ECB has changed uh, since uh, since uh, 2012, but mostly after 2015, when the purchasing uh, program purchase program started the, the quantitative easing and now uh, we have it reached like three uh, three trillion uh, uh, the ECB reached three trillion uh, asset like uh, assets in in its balance sheet in in 2012 but now we are seeing that the that mm, the balance sheet of oh sorry the balance sheet of uh, the Euro, the ECB is uh, at seven trillion. So, and the the purchase uh, uh, program has reached three trillion in the in, in last March. So, it's uh, becoming very very big. Uh, we see here, for example, the asymmetrical uh, impact on spreads uh, for countries in the EU that are in the eurozone and not in the eurozone. For example, Greece, Spain, and Italy have had, uh, or, and also Slovenia, have had spikes on in the spreads when the crisis started. And Christine Lagarde said that we are not here to close the spreads. Uh, and you don't see that in, in the spreads of Denmark or Sweden, for example, or Poland. Uh, so that also shows us the, the nature of, or the relation of uh, this hierarchy and the institutions of the, of, of the euro and uh, the, the indebtedness and the, the vulnerability of, of, um, of the countries uh, related to the euro that are not you know, hegemonic or are not in, in power. And then we see also the target two that also reflects, uh, shows, uh, casts some light on this hegemony by, by Germany. You, we see uh, Germany accumulating red ink, let's say, uh, claims on on other countries, especially uh, in, uh, Spain and Italy, which are let's say the other two big countries uh, having the liabilities. Uh, the target two is a is a I would summarize it as the system that substitutes within the the eurozone uh, the reserve system, the exchange, the foreign exchange system. So here, what we see is that as a result of these uh, expansionary programs. Uh, Germany has allowed, uh, let's say, to um, the financing uh, of the, let's say, the what would have done the, the foreign reserves 
of the uh, Bank of Spain or the Bank of Italy. So it has maintained, let's say, uh, the dynamics, uh, mercantilist dynamics in the in the eurozone. So that also shows the hegemony, the position of hegemony and the, and the hierarchy uh, in in the eurozone, which is, as I say, even if it's uh, fiscal policies are a bit different or completely different, uh, they are coherent with this, uh, let's say, trend or a structural feature. So, and to finish, uh, we also have, uh, let's say, different uh, uh, differences in the, in the, or I don't know if, if difference, the approach to the to the last crisis is very very different. So we see here the the, the additional spending or foregone revenue and the let's say below the line measures. Uh, so it's uh, contingent liabilities of the different countries. And we see here uh, that Germany has been uh, the country uh, implementing uh, after Greece. Uh, implementing more direct uh, men, uh, additional spending, and uh, the the country also uh, after Italy that has done uh, the biggest below the line uh, stimulus as well. So Germany has engaged in a very very aggressive uh, expansionary policy, and that also shows its uh, its power and and its uh, flexibility in this crisis. So to conclude, uh, we see that there is a conflict uh, between core member states and transnational institutions, but it is overstated. It has to be understood in this in this uh, you know hybrid mode. Uh, policies adopted since the beginning of the COVID nineteen crisis are compatible with Germ German hegemony. They are not contradictory to 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 what Germany has been doing, although. They have required flexibility by by the hegemon, and discretion and transgression of the treaties have become the new, the new normal. So the it is very unclear uh, whether this flexibility can be reversed in the next years and whether we will back, go back to austerity. What will happen? So we are in uh, uncertain times, and and Germany has a difficult position here in in keeping this uh, let's say dual role of ha a hard fist and and keeping the eurozone together. And that would be it. Uh, I give the floor to, to Christina. Thanks for listening. Yes, indeed. I mean, this, this, thanks, Sergio. This was very informative and gives us also lots of food for thought and for discussion. For our participants, if you have questions already, you can already post them in the chat box or in the, in the question and answer box so that we have a bit of time to study them before the discussion starts then. But for now, we turn to Christina for the second presentation. Christina, please go ahead. Okay, um, everybody can see that okay? Yeah, great. So um, I'm hoping to provide some kind of an intermediate step between the first session and the second um, by trying to draw some lessons or sort of reflections on the Eurozone crisis and what that means for international debt architecture uh, or non-system architecture. So um, with each new crisis that the world experiences, there is this renewed sort of desire to search for lessons from the past. And um, that seems to be a, re a repeated thing that happens with each new crisis. But each time that happens, um, and one just confronts similar disappointments about how um, sort of the same ad hocery and the same problems resurfacing again and again. So in my talk, I'm going to point out some of those failings uh, that became apparent during the Eurozone crisis um, to illustrate how we're continuing down very much the same path, because meaningful change on that institutional sort of level um, wasn't take, didn't take place. Uh, and I'm going to try and point out what just some reflections about what that means for um, the current pandemic crisis. Um, so I'm going to start with um let's just see okay uh just a couple of pointers 
Um, just to remind people, I also know that you've been, um, those who've been following this as a course have sort of had many sessions already to familiarize with a lot of the issues, but um, I just want to say why, it's, why it does it matter for debts to be sustainable? And uh, it's kind of obvious, but not obvious to all, that um, people really suffer when they're not. Why? Because the crisis, um, the cost of debt crises uh, in economic, social and political terms is huge. Um, there's very large contractions of GDP. Um, this little graph at the top right here shows uh, reductions in real GDP uh, indexed to 100 uh, at the beginning of a crisis, and it compares different crises. Um, the there's always a deterioration of standard of living, okay, very high degrees of political instability. And it means that debt crises have very broad implications, not only for financial stability and growth, but for the realization of socioeconomic rights and the ability of people to access sort of basic services. Um, so while debt can enable states to pursue domestic economic social policies to promote you know, development goals, um, if things don't go well, they throw millions of people into poverty. Um, so debt crises matter. Um, the other thing is that the main way that people address them, the main thing that, that uh, authorities do is to implement austerity as a way of uh, repaying debts. So contractions in government spending, public sector cuts, weakening of social protection, structural reforms, deregulation of product labor and capital markets, privatizations, um, all during a rapid contraction of GDP, so pro-cyclical policy, with huge negative effects on poverty and equality, especially with great impacts on vulnerable people. Um, so main response to debt crisis is entirely ineffective. Um, and the third point that um, is worth mentioning is that it also really matters to have debts be labeled sustainable when in fact they're not. Because um, there, there is nothing that prevents at the moment uh, in this current system, um, the, the majority of people in a country not being able to access basic services because the country hasn't got the fiscal space and the capacity to invest in decent um, sort of services, and yet those debts be labelled as sustainable by financial institutions, and predominantly their assessors, so the World Bank and the IMF. So with a sustainable label, creditors continue to extend and pretend Okay, extend loans, pretend nothing's, nothing's going on, and prioritizing the repayment of creditors to the detriment of the needs of the borrowing country. Um, it underestimates the severity of the crisis and undermines the needed relief. So basically, unsustainable debts fester, that fester lead to a situation of a debt overhang, economic activities hampered um, by the future prospect of repayment. So those spread yields that um, uh, Sergi showed at the beginning of the, um, what is it, Lagarde's most costly four words, we're not here to, co to, to close the spreads, um, just indicates uh, some of what that debt overhang actually means uh, in terms of billions, um, upcoming payments. Um, so just um, on that second point about the response on um, uh, sort of society, that bottom graph here is just, um, this is for working poor um, sort of, social standards degrade so, so far that um, even those in work are great risk of social poverty, um, social exclusion and poverty. So um, it's always hard to know how much people have followed the Eurozone crisis or followed it at the time because it's now quite some time ago, certainly with the global financial crisis when teaching at university, um, it seems like it was miles ago, uh, you know, ages ago. So um, this is just to bring to mind some, some features um, which I've tried to organize roughly around the sort of shortcomings that Bodo uh, briefly mentioned earlier. So sort of as an illustration of some of those shortcomings that Bodo discussed in um, part one. So what kind of, what shortcomings uh, in international debt architecture became apparent during the crisis? Well, um, financial issues were obviously, financial issues of certain actors were prioritized over all else. Um, the main criteria for how the Eurozone crisis was dealt was to prevent financial stability in core country banks, whereby creditor countries preferred to provide um, these official funds, um, you know, sort of scrambled together bilateral loans 
um, new institutions that Sergio mentioned to the FSF and the ESM to countries which were then which then used those funds to repay the creditors with only a small very small proportion of the bailout funds entering and staying in the country. Um, so part of this led to um, the way that this was dealt rather than restructuring up front meant that there was a delay. Some countries obviously didn't go through it, but Greece um, had a large restructuring in 2012. Um, deteriorating uh, debt situations and prolonging the crisis. I mean, one wonders when did the Eurozone crisis exactly end? Um, and this was only possible, this strategy was only possible at the very high cost of austerity. And if you read about um, sort of how um, the 80s crisis was dealt with, you hear much the same story. The 80s crisis was dealt with in order to protect, you know, the US financial sector that had overlent to Latin America. So in a way it was successful because financial stability was, was curtailed at the cost of a lost decade. Um, so second point, um, the Eurozone crisis really revealed how creditor dominated the system is. How was the credit, how was the crisis handled? Well, the Troika, um, who no one had heard of until um, the beginning of 2010, came together, three institutions, the IMF, the European Commission and the European Central Bank, forming an unaccountable and illegitimate trio of policymakers. Um, they muddled through and pushed through the creditor-led crisis response. Um, there was a huge, all in many, many instances, obvious political influence exerted over lending decisions, uh, the most notable being the IMF pushing through a programme that much of its board disagreed over and did so only by bending its own rules. Likewise, the ECB's power to strangle liquidity um, at key moments. Okay. Um, so the other thing to note is that the Eurozone crisis has also been mired um, especially in as part of this issue of delays by creditor conflicts. So not just the conflict between debtors and creditors, but actually creditors between themselves that lead to delays about what to do. Um, not most notably, the clash between the EU and the IMF um, over what is and is not sustainable. So while they argue about that, um, you know, fiscal measures are passed. Uh, what's at stake is the size of the primary balance um, for decades into the future. Um, and likewise, what we saw once again, which is part of this fragmented system that was mentioned at the start, is um, um, the, the only way that the restructuring of private sector bonds was only possible, because private creditors won't volunteer um, into haircuts, was only through upfront cash. So a large portion of the bailout was to um, ensure their participation um, in, a, in a restructuring that ended up vastly under-resourcing the pension funds, uh, with further loans needed to recapitalize the banks. Again, uh, all in the context of ruthless and counterproductive austerity. Okay, big case of too little, too late. Um, the problems of not having a comprehensive system where one data goes to one forum to address all creditors at the same time, but instead has to um, negotiate with each se se segment of its debt. Okay, the private sector involvement, official sector involvement, um, how those two interact, which is, um, you know, rings a lot of bells um, from other crises as well. Uh, this idea of what's the role of the institutions in the end of the day that's to facilitate the sort of capital flight fully funded through bailout loans. Um, the Eurozone crisis also, also illustrated, was a good illustration of um, how holdouts, um, minority um, bondholders, can pursue a successful strategy of not participating in the restructuring. So once sort of fairly small portion of Greeks, Greece outstanding um, loans were under foreign law, um, some creditors scrambled to buy those and uh, acquired bottom positions. So they weren't restructured and almost six and a half billion euros in holdouts were paid in full and on time, uh, redeeming 100% of value uh, at a time when Greece had uh, at some point fallen into payment arrears with the fund and was pushing through austerity programs. And the narrative is important because the narrative at the time was, oh, Northern Europeans um, sort of bailing out Southern Europeans. So the fact, the strength of the rhetoric on the basis of actually where the money was going uh, is a huge chasm in how things are portrayed. 
So the lack of transparency accountability that was mentioned earlier, I just want to point out how, uh, again, on the policy level, accountability level, agreements were behind closed doors. National parliaments were pushed aside. Um, national court decisions sort of um, not really taken seriously. Technocratic governments in place. And in light of this whole sort of permanency around what a state of emergency is. Um, in terms of like actual economic design, program design did not make any sense. Uh, certainly not in the Greek uh, example, and uh, just sort of reaffirmed the lack of credibility in how debtors assess um, who they're lending to in terms of debt sustainability. So some broad overarching points that came out of this. Well, how was the Eurozone crisis dealt with? Um, well, it, the way it was dealt with enhanced the North-South divide, the inequalities between North-South divide. Um, Sergi point, made those points um, very, very clearly about how that sort of played out. Um, that creates a sort of unequal ability to respond to next crises. Um, certainly we see that now after a decade of weakened, underfunded um, sort of health systems. Um, the Euro crisis also exposed um, just the fragility of these institutions' ability to make competent decisions in a time of crisis. Uh, it cast doubt on the confidence um, to crisis manage and without any accountability at the end. So serious failures and no one was held to account. Um, so the other thing that was very prominent was this um, overwhelming emphasis on the source of debt problems being domestic, as if countries are in debt problems just because of their own mismanagement, rather than looking at structural or external um, sort of issues, things that are outside of debtors control. Um, so this, the, the feeling very much is and was that when the creditors roof is not on fire, they can keep kicking the can down the road. So I just want to have a small interlude before I move on to some things to do with the COVID pandemic briefly, is um, just to illustrate um, some of the paradoxical um, uh, outcomes of this. So at the top figure, we can see the uh, Greek government debt as a proportion of GDP, which is measured on the right-hand scale. And in the darker blue is the spread of Greek yields over German bonds. So at the beginning, this lighter blue line at the beginning of the crisis was just over 100% of debt to GDP. And this is the result of 10 years of crisis management, that now it's over 200% of GDP. And um, that big abrupt decline in 2012 is the pre-SI restructuring, um, after which um, the debt kept climbing. And yet you see the spreads going down close to zero. Greece is borrowing up. Uh, at remarkably low, low rates right now. Um, so recall that before the crisis, most of the debt was held by the private sectors. Um, now it's almost exclusively in official hands. So why would the spreads go up now? Well, the private sector knows that there's now a, there's a there's a big borrower out there, the ECB, who's purchasing Greek bonds, whereas it wasn't, which was excluded from these programs before. Um, and that any future debt problems that Greece, uh, you know, may and will run into. Um, are predominantly for the official sector to resolve because they're a minority. This is in the bottom right hand chart here is um, approximate ownership uh, at the moment with bonds uh, just over 20%. So why would, again, with, in terms of the need for independent assessors, well, the creditors are right, the ones writing the DSAs. So of course they will accept what they say. And just seeing today's um, the IMF just released today its country report for Greece. Again, the, the thing is that what, does, what, what actually matters in terms of DSA? Is it medium term? Is it long term? Is it financing, gross finance, you know, financing rollover risk, or is it levels, absolute levels? So these are the sorts of debates that prevent um, sort of uh, kind of reductions that are needed. So um, just briefly to conclude. So there's a bit of a sense of deja vu for those who are following the COVID crisis. Um, and I just wanna highlight some of them. So COVID and debt, um, lots of these features are coming up again, insufficient access to condition-free and debt-free liquidity, um, reliant, you know, reliance on a creditor-run system, the G20, the Paris Club. Paris Club's an informal uh, group of creditors and yet, the fates of countries' restructurings are in, are, in, are in their hands. These are illegitimate organisations that have enormous amounts of disordinate amounts of power. Um, same with the creditor on IFIs, just the quota reform 
for the fund was agreed in 2010, wasn't implemented to 2016, I think. Um, huge resistance to uh, quota reform. Um, the G20 introduced the DSSI in the common framework. Um, very much too little, too late. Again, another case of with voluntary, uh, with private sector being um, voluntary, uh, their participation being voluntary, we get again this sort of um, so official sector subsidizing uh, and enabling the private sector to be repaid. Um, austerity ad infinitum, recent research has shown that uh, almost 85% of the world's population will be living under austerity for the years to come. Um, again, relies on undue labels of sustainability to wave through programs, leaving problems to fester. That's what the fund's doing with its huge ramping up of emergency loans. There was no mandatory stay of litigation in national governments, so countries can be litigated just like they were with HIPIC. The amount of um, when the HIPIC program came in for poor uh, income countries, um, private creditors uh, litigated um, and spent years um, dragging HIPIC countries through the courts. And again, in terms of the sort of overarching feature, we end up with a very similar story, a debt sort of crisis approach that exacerbates global inequality between countries, again, with the onus of resolving on the debtors, rather than looking at how to resolve things on a structural and systemic way. And um, I'm just trying to point out how this lack of institutional change, it was the opportunity, uh, that opportunity, unfortunately, comes up time and time again, and yet it's never taken. And so this just perpetuates um, uh, these, these problems. So. Um, I'm not going to go into this final slide, but it will be there to share. Um, it's just to narrow in that uh, on the DSA issue, this is a sort of, uh, it deserves more attention as a part of the sort of dysfunctional architecture. And there are alternatives uh, to integrate DSAs with soft law principles, sustainable development goals and within a human rights framework. And there are people working on those, so worth looking them up. I've added a list of resources that might be helpful. Um, so, so, so some of my work and uh, sort of colleagues' work that I appreciate. Uh, top of the list is the Hellenic Parliament preliminary report on the Truth Commission public debt. Uh, worth looking into if you want to see what that committee came up with um, in 2015. Um, sort of a big guidebook on sovereign debt and human rights and a critical guide to the Eurozone debt crisis, something I wrote a long time ago when I was working for um, Corporate Watch. And if you're not familiar with the Eurozone crisis, it is a good introduction. So I'm going to end it there and thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Christina. Um, these were two, I found very, very interesting presentations. Um, I mean, this, you, you did end your presentation by saying deja vu about the COVID-19 crisis. I still, I must say, I personally still find it remarkable how different policy responses can be to different crises when we, when we, when we look at the EU institution response um, to the Euro crisis and to the current COVID-19 crisis, especially the much more active role of the European Central Bank. I mean, I was surprised. I um, I remember four years ago, everyone told us the next shock will lead to a new debt crisis in, 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 in Greece and Italy is at the, at, the, at the brink of collapse, basically. And basically now with a much more active role of the European Central Bank, no, no, people are no longer talking about this, basically. So it seems actually that, um, I mean, a more active role of the ECB, at least in a region like ours as Europe, where we basically have debt, which can be considered domestic debt, um, could have avoided many, many problems. But yeah, one thing, and there's a question related to this, one thing that also has changed is that in this crisis, the EU lifted the restrictions of the Stability and Growth Pact. So there's a question for you then that's asking what you think is going to happen, what, what's going to happen with the Stability and Growth Pact conditions, which of course, and then or criteria, which of course in practice were mainly, were mainly um, austerity criteria for the countries of the European Union. And then there were four, um, a couple of questions basically related to the Angolan context, but I mean, since you're debt experts, you might want to respond to these ones as well. The question was, I mean, that the Angolan government argues that um, that despite the country having a debt ratio of 226% of GDP, it's still sustainable. How can this be? And, and I think the, the other one is also interesting for you. There's a question because you too have been involved in the debt audit um, in Angola, the question is how a country like Angola could set up a debt initiative on national level. So let's start with these ones. Um, I don't know, who, who of you wants to start? Please go ahead, Sergi, if you want. Well, 
I, I'll try to to give my opinion on on what uh, I think can happen uh, with uh, the stability and growth pack and uh, austerity in general, as uh, you know, as we colloquially call it. Uh, I think it, it's going to be very difficult to reestablish this framework framework seriously. I think it has lost credibility, and now we are in a in a moment of history uh, of the European Union that, uh, let's say, uh, discretion has it has imposed itself, and there have there has been too much discretion already. In the, in the last crisis, uh, there was some, let's say, uh, rules-based functioning, but there were a lo lots of discretion and lots of flexibility uh, because the stability angle of PAC was, uh, let's say, uh, had lots of loopholes and it was complex and, you know, it was not uh, implemented perfectly. But now we, with this symmetric shock, which is the difference, I would say, between these two shocks, uh, in the Eurozone in 2010, the, the shock was asymmetric. This is why uh, when shocks are asymmetric and debt grows more in a region than in another, then uh, you know we have this relative difference and this is why this debt crisis emerged. But now we are seeing something different. So uh, in this new crisis, uh, this discretionality has imposed it itself. And uh, in my opinion, uh, the path to integration in this neo-functionalist neo way, as I was saying, like the idea of creating a nation and dissolving national sovereignty into a big European nation, I think this is not going to work. And probably what we will see is uh, the European Union going forward, but in a much more, let's say, uh, uncommitted way, much more flexible, much more discretionary, and in a, in a way in which uh, intergovernmentalism intergovern will impose itself. Uh, so it's going to be a, an arena, a, a game in which, you know, all these bargains will be reached and there will be this flexibility. And for sure, Northern countries or core countries will ask for some conditions and will ask, you know, for some uh, like fiscal, uh, mm, rigidity or fiscal like uh, uh, behavior, but uh, I don't see this strict framework, um, you know, imposing itself again uh, without difficulty, with, without difficulty at, at least, because as, as we are saying, the levels of debt are very, very high. And if uh, there's a change in interest rates, there's a change in inflation patterns in the, in the coming years and uh, things change, uh, then uh, the, the, a new debt crisis in the Eurozone could, could explode and, and also uh, the, Euro, the, the, Euro could be, the Euro system could be in danger. And that's not in the interest, as, as I explained, of Germany, which, uh, you know, acquires its hegemony through, through these institutions. So Germany has to impose certain discipline, but at least, but, uh, but also uh, keep the Eurozone alive. Uh, that's, that's the condition to, 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 be the, to, be, to become or to, to keep hegemony. So that's, a, that, that's the way I, I see it. I would leave the other questions related to Angola, to Christina, uh, because I don't really know the case uh, that well. Uh, but like very shortly, I would say that um, there is political economy and power involved. So uh, the, and also the composition of debt, uh, the, the maturities, there are many issues that can, you know, make, let's say a huge debt uh, seem sustainable. And some of them relate to what Christina was explaining, the, the debt sustainability analysis, uh, you know, done by by creditors and uh, like uh, you know favoring a, a view and or some power relations, but I leave it to to Christina. Okay, Christina, if you could quickly um, respond to that question, and there were also there was a question directly addressed to you. The question was about the role of credit rating agencies in the in the Greek debt crisis. And then the last one just came in, and I think this is where we have to stop because we're running out of time. 
which is are there alternatives for the euro and ecb policy what ethical advices could you give to the general pu public to protect their savings um okay i'll just pick up on the credit rating agencies i think my um absolutely um credit rating agencies have a very crucial role in how debt crises unfold um because they work in a pro cyclical way so by through their downgrades um, they exacerbate the spike the spike in spreads they help price countries out the market um again i think just to um, also link this to the first point that bodo made um one of the points that i was trying to say in my presentation was uh, we need to identify the cogs in the system there's sort of the disparate norms and and actors that make up what's called how just that that the are in play when countries face repayment difficulties and see in fact that with many opportunities for reform they haven't been reformed and so once again we're confronting the same set of problems credit rating agencies is a very good example um with the current pandemic and how they've um again exacerbated the ability of countries um to uh, to borrow i'm just going to post in the chat um oh sorry apologies that's um article four of greece that came out today um i, I, I was going to mention something from that just one second um independent expert on the effect of human rights uh on the effect on foreign debt on human rights recently latest human report to the human rights council is on the role of credit agent agencies in debt crises in having a role in uh, preventing sort of the promotion of human rights through their actions and how they um uh, and the role that they play in, in crisis so i think that might be um just a helpful resource for um for that question um, the other point, I, sorry about that IMF link, but in fact, you might find it interesting. Uh, it links a little bit to the Angola question, uh, only only so far as, um, you know, you, you might also wonder, but how is it possible that a debt that's so high is judged as being sustainable? And I think that there's a couple of, there's many um, elements to that question. Um, the, the, the main one that I'm trying to get across is that it depends who's assessing it and for what reason and why. So debt's viewed as sustainable one day by the IMF, then won't. And if you read, you know, and, and if you, if that comes across very clearly in the Article 4 of Greece, it's like, oh, well, it is sustainable in the medium run because of the negative in interest rate and growth differential. Hmm, however, in the long run, well, we might have to see. And if you look at all of these assessments over time, the power dynamics behind them, um, their sort of reliance on the sort of assumptions that they put in, uh, really driving the results. And in one of the um, resources that I've got at the end there, I've got a sort of history of the tools called More of an Art Than a Science, um, the making of the IMF's debt sustainability analysis, which I think you might find interesting. Um, so in the case of Angola, and I shouldn't really speak because I don't know about the context per se, but just how is it possible? Um, I think it really depends on, you know, what is the, what is the management of the debt situation? And how, how are they, what, why would the debt be ruled? On, what are the assumptions on which that's being judged as sustainable? Um, so I'd have to look at it in more depth to give you more of an answer. But in terms of the strategy for a debt audit, I think Greece was in quite a particular moment historically at the beginning of 2015. And the parliament itself created a parliamentary committee to audit the country's debt. And there's a lot of experience um, in sort of interactions between citizen level debt audits, trying to pursue sort of more official um, debt audits. Eurodad and others have a lot of experience. I think Eurodad has also released a report recently on debt audits, which might be helpful. And there are a lot of resources from past experiences in Greece, but also uh, in other countries um, that could be helpful. Okay, thank you, Christina. I I basically overlooked one question which came in for Sergi. Perhaps we can take this this last question as well. Um, there's a couple of minutes left, but uh, Sergi, there was a question to you: if you might have oversimplified the situation by creating a um, divide between Germany and the stars, and what what is uh, could you elaborate a little bit more on the role of other Eurozone members apart from Germany, like the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, or Austria? Yes, uh, I didn't have much time to 
to get into detail, but I pointed to Germany because it's the, the hegemon, it's the leader that there is certainly a coalition and uh, let's say an alliance of countries, uh, the, those that you were mentioning that have, you know, aligned uh, interests and have, uh, you know, uh, voted in, in an aligned way and have pressured within the, the European institutions in, in such a way. So, I mean, uh, uh, if you want to, to call it that, it, yeah, it's an oversimplification. Is this, this is actually a summary of a paper that we have re written with uh, Professor Costas Lapaditsas. Uh, we'll probably publish it soon. So these are some of the ideas that that have uh, that the paper contains. I didn't have time to get into into those uh, like ideas, like for example, the the balance sheet of the of the the euro system for example i showed it that i didn't have time to develop for example that the, it it actually is uh, divided in, in national state terms for example only two trillions of these 11 trillions total uh, of the euro system are in the hands of the ecb and the rest are for example in the in in the different uh, in the different uh, central banks uh, you know balance sheets so these this kind of points, uh, uh, you know, need time and didn't have time to, to, to develop more there. But uh, I will share the, the presentation with you or I have done that. So I hope that, that you can share it as well with, with our uh, listeners. Okay, then, well, unfortunately, we have to stop here because we ran out of time, but thank you all for very rich presentations for a very interesting debate. Well, thanks to all the speakers, of course, and also many thanks to the interpreters and, um, and of course, for the, for the funders, for the donors of, who made the event possible. Um, I think the next session is going to take place on the 23rd of June, so unless you're, yeah, right, um, Ilaria just posted, um, I think, I think it's yeah, she just posted the link in the in, in, in the chat box. So if you're not registered for the next session, then please do so. And yeah, from my part, thank you very much for participating. Have a good day. I hope you enjoyed the presentation and the discussions. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.